I was listening to a podcast. It was um, Fair Marriage podcast with Sheila. You were on that episode and um, you were talking about Genesis 316. And I thought like the Ephesians, um, First Timothy, so many of um, these verses that I'd been taught, like set really tight limits on women. Um, they would go back to the created order. They would go back to Genesis to talk about how it's always been this way, or, you know, this was God's design, at least for after the fall. And, um, I thought, okay, this is really interesting. Is somebody who obviously, um, takes God's word seriously. I think that's another, um, thing I've been kind of conditioned is like, you had to see these verses this way or, um, you kind of had a low regard for God's word. Welcome to the Eden Podcast, where we true the verse of Genesis 3.16, and we discover that God didn't curse Eve or Adam or limit woman in any way. Where we have some special time with good friends of the True 316 Foundation. My name is Bruce C.E. Fleming, and I'm the executive director of the True 316 Foundation, which is the home of the Eden Podcast. Our special co-host is Christy, and I'm going to ask Christy if you will introduce our guest. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, Bethany Soflin comes from Nebraska. Hi, Bethany. Welcome today. Hey. Uh, Today, uh, we'll be learning more about Bethany, but she is a mom of three daughters, ages 11, 10, and 8, and she has a son who's four. She's a homeschooling mom and a college student and has hopes of becoming a Christian counselor. She loves learning more about who the God of the Bible is and what this means for her life today. And she enjoys caring for chickens and Nigerian dwarf goats in her spare time. I like that detail, Bethany. (laughs) They're the best goat, so no. (laughs) I don't know anything about Nigerian dwarf goats. I didn't until about a year ago. They're just, they're the smaller goats and people use them for therapy and they're really, they've got like sweet disposition. So they're like teddy bear goats. Anyways, they're fun. (laughs) therapy goats I have a lot to learn I'm gonna have to ask you more about this later I want to know more about that's awesome I love dogs because they I love to cuddle them I've never thought about a goat they're like a mixture of the two they're really great so anyways (laughs) we'll talk more later yes (laughs) yes we will that's awesome um Bruce but I will probably refer to you as dad if that's okay because Bruce is my dad and I'm proud to be your daughter and um, that defines our relationship as how, as, which will probably come up in our interactions on this podcast. So thanks for having me on as your co-host for True Friends Friday, Dad. And all let's life, get started. All your life long, I'm used to you being my daughter. So let's keep it going right now. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so Bethany, I feel, like, I feel like I've known Bethany for quite a while. And, and one of the things you're famous for around, around True 316 is that uh, you, did a, you did a selfie for us one day oh. <laughs> and, you, and you had the book of Eden and you had a big smile and I posted it on Facebook and it went viral. <laughs> so you, you That's are, funny. you are, our, you still hold the record as our most famous uh, selfie person. So as my husband will be really proud of me. I'm sure. No, <laughs> he doesn't take as many selfies as I do. Yeah. No, that's cool. <laughs> Well, you're a practice <laughs> selfie doer. So I want to ask you, start, let's start out with a, um, the background question. What, what would be your faith story? How did you come to know Christ and and grow and grow in him? Yeah, that's a good question. So I um I was raised in like a home that really emphasized faith, Christian faith, and I don't actually have any recollection of like not knowing about Jesus. I do recollect like one night my dad sat me down, we kind of did the sinner's prayer thing. I mean, he told me about how Jesus had taken all my sin and shame and um, I got to be with him forever in heaven if I just trusted in him. And I, I said the sinner's prayer and I meant it and, um, nothing changed. Like I kept, um, I'm, I meant it and nothing changed in that respect at all. Um, and I like, it wasn't kind of like one and done. It was like, I put quite a bit of energy and devotion into my relationship with Jesus. I always found Jesus like very compelling. And so, um, that's how I got to know of Jesus. It just kind of was incorporated into my life. Um, something that might be a little unique about my experience or make it distinctive from some others is that like some lies crept in, um, 
to my faith journey. And I started like, not necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily like mark this correct on a test, but I definitely lived as if it was true in some areas that God was like pretty rigid, um, punitive, maybe had to keep distance from me. And that's, it's kind of the opposite of the gospel, but it really was something I, I was holding both to be true in my experience. Um, and when I like reflect on my life, I'm about 37 now for at least 25 years, I really, really wrestled with, um, kind of this idea. I was only lovable if I was like compliant. Um, I found I was not, I didn't trust that I was likable. Um, and then I also wrestled with like, I think this maybe impacted why I felt that way, but I really wrestled with, um, some of my instincts, like, um, I felt like I had really strong desires to protect others to like justice. I was kind of, um, speaking up about injustice was something I was kind of attracted to. And, um, I kind of thought those were maybe not fitting of like being female, um, was raised kind of with these tight, this is, you know, maybe a virtue that's good for men. And this is a virtue that's good for women. We kind of like split those virtues a little bit. So I really believed that maybe there was something broken in that I expressed, um, some of these virtues or they just sort of like my go-to things when it would be more fitting if I, you know, if of somebody other than me. And um, one thing that got me kind of into trouble too was this belief that men were the spiritual leaders. And I got married, I married an awesome dude, but sometimes I would like pray and ask him to join me. And that's no big deal if that's once, but it was just kind of natural for me to do that a lot. And I would be really conflicted like, oh man, is this right? Should I be kind of waiting? And so I experienced, I think, I think now it was a lot of fa like false guilt but I kind of didn't believe God was happy with me because some of these things like just saying, Hey, you know, there's these prayer requests. Let's, let's pray. Um, I kind of felt guilty about even doing that and, um, wondering if I was taking away leadership that wasn't mine. You thought and you were, I, you thought you were leading him by suggesting that you pray. Um, well, I was initiating, right? Like yeah, I would yeah. be the one suggesting it first. Um, there's different definitions of leadership for sure. But one of the things leadership can be is being the initiator, right? And so, and that's something I heard more than once is that men should be initiators, you know, and it was confusing. It was confusing for me, but I experienced guilt over, yeah, oddly enough, over saying, hey, let's pray for these prayer requests. And when I had children too, I think it was more natural for me to just like kind of find these teaching moments with them about the Bible or about God. And I remember several times reflecting and being like, okay, I did that right in front of my husband. He never, ever said, oh, by the way, I'm offended or I'm insecure about you doing this. But I would kind of think, I just, I was scared to walk in the freedom that I now believe I always had. I was scared to walk in that freedom thinking he's supposed to be the spiritual leader of our family. Right. And so I am the one vocalizing the spiritual truths first and more often. So what am I doing? Wow. And so anyways, that was something that um, is just like true of my faith journey. And um, I guess like <laughs> some of the teaching I was under too was to doubt my perception of things, like defer to others' opinions. And that was at least partially um, because of my gender. There was, there was a lot of different arguments I heard through the years, like being at all these different church meetings and different religious events and stuff. But um, sometimes it was explained men were the leaders because they had better discernment. And so then it, it led to a lot of back and forth thinking in my own mind, like, okay, this feels right, but, and I just like have to clear stuff with my husband a lot. And wow. I don't think he always understood my thought processes with that. So anyways, um, in, I think it was in 2017, um, a counselor at my church and a pastor, um, both like, well, it was in, it was, um, different experiences with both of them, but it was like, I, I feel like God was working through both of them in a really profound way. So, um, experiences with like guided prayer with the counselors. And then just, there was 
a new pastor who had come to our church and he was very relational and he, um, get, let my voice have weight in some of the questions I had. And, um, those experiences really pro- profoundly changed, um, how I saw God, um, where I thought before he was probably judging me. I like had, um, this confidence that he was actually weeping with me that some of the stuff that I'd been taught, um, yeah, he really wanted me to be treated a certain way or whatever. Like his heart was like breaking over that. And it, it was kind of a, it was, it was coming from both of these different places and it, um, both my relationship with the counselor and that prayer and this pastor who treated me just so respectfully. And like, I had a ton of value and I was like, okay, I got God's heart really wrong somehow. And that profoundly changed the way I like related to scripture and like God just felt so safe. And so, um, like somebody I wanted to be around and not just like, um, somebody that I wanted to impress or, you know, get approval from, like, I I understood I had approval. He, he viewed me as if, um, I was as righteous as Christ now because of Christ's work and he, he loved me so much. And so, um, that was when I started really realizing, um, I could read the Bible, like, my whole life and know lots of verses from memory and stuff, which I mean, it's so great to have that religious instruction. And I could kind of not understand what love was, um, at the same time. And some of the verses that I've been told, like, were definitely showing that God's, you know, kind of still, um, demanded some of these things or whatever, you know, like some, somewhere, something had been off, something had been wrong. And I thought I had understood but I definitely didn't understand. So that got me really curious about um, the freedom I found after that got me really curious about if there was any other areas in my life where the interpretation of God's word had been twisted. And I became like really hungry for understanding God's word better for being able to um, study it myself better and also like listen to others who had studied it well. And, um, I kind of couldn't, couldn't stop. It's what I wanted to do there for like a pretty long season was just like, I was in love with God's word. That's amazing. That's really cool. I, I, something that stands out to me is that it was the, it was like the crossroads of two different people over the same season of your life, demonstrating this, character and nature of God that you hadn't really experienced that then piqued your interest and hunger to go back to the word of God and want to explore it for yourself. Like that's, that's really cool to me that God brought that about in that way. And that it, it was people just loving you. It wasn't people coming in and being like, you've got this wrong and you need to change your mindsets or you need a new belief system. Or it was just, it sounds like it was just them treating you well and loving you well. And the doors that opened for you, it's really beautiful. Yeah, definitely. So there's like, yeah, it was a, a case of like head knowledge and, you know, like experience or whatever. And I think both are great, but um, the experience was very powerful for me. For so sure. along along the way now, as you're, you're going to church, you love the Lord. Um, when, when, when the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, he gives us also spiritual gifts to use, one or more. Uh, were you, how were you using those spiritual gifts during this conflicted period in your life? Yeah. Um, well, I touched, I touched on like maybe just like, um, the one just like I, it was easy for me to go to God and stuff with my family, but I was also, I'm, um, I was also involved in ministries in my church. Um, prior to 2017, I was, I helped with, um, uh, mothers of preschool program. Um, I was kind of, community wide, not just like church wide. And, um, I attended Bible studies, like women's Bible studies a lot, but that was, and I'd help with, um, VBS. I'm not, I'm not professional minister by any means. Um, but like then after 2017 and following, um, I found myself, like I started a Bible study in my home, but then pretty soon I was helping our church with women's Bible studies and I was still involved in mops or in a, the mothers of preschool program. And I, um, started being on the, um, 
women's Bible study committee, we kind of figured out the scope and direction and um, different things that we wanted to do for studies. And I was also just like meeting with people, like just very unprofessionally, but just mostly for encouragement. And I was kind of like, come and see like to like with the counselor and the pastor and everything. I was like, okay, yeah, like I've been a Christian my whole life too, but like God, like really loves us. Like he actually, he actually loves us. And love doesn't mean, you know, kind of like plugging your nose and like being back here. It's like, he wants to be in a relationship and you know, that's like Emmanuel God with us or whatever. But I just like, I realized that in a profound new way. And, um, wow. so I got deeper involved in just like in different ministries in my church, um, following that experience for sure. It was kind of what, um, where I found most joy was like helping <laughs> like trans transfer that joy God had given me to other people and in various ways. Um, this was also though, where I had kind of some painful, like aha moments. I was really involved with several, with lots of different women in our community. And, um, there were women who were in very distressed marriages, um, or, um, in just situations with their husbands that were pretty, pretty hard. And, um, several people shared with me and I, um, at the time, like I was like sold out, whatever God wanted. And I had just been taught that like, there were these like godly limitations for women and totally wanted, I mean, God had given me so much joy and peace. And I just wanted to encourage people, you know, trust God, he's got you and everything. So I did what I, um, thought, you know, was helpful. And I would encourage them, you know, make sure your husband knows he's the leader, maybe submit more. And I encourage them to go to other like more seasoned Christians who kind of told them the same message. I supported books that were kind of like, you know, very, very like encourage the, encourage the husband to be the leader. Um, and I thought I was like blessing people, but it was in that season that, um, a couple really profound, um, I don't know, situations became really profound to me and that these women, I was like walking with them pretty closely and they seemed really sincere in um, complying, you know, with whatever their husband kind of said, doing the things that these books recommended or the other leaders recommended, or I was recommending and their marriages, like um, one became like even more physically abusive. There was physical abuse happening and another was like betrayal was covered up. And then when it, um, was brought to the light it was really um it was really ugly and really it was really ugly and really awful and um it felt just like icky being kind of involved in that like trust your husband tell him he's the leader but you know there was something not quite adding up in these women who i just wanted them to know this like love and peace and joy these women ended up just feeling their outcome was terrible and they ended up feeling uncared for and not understood and kind of unprotected by the religious community. And um, since I'd been involved pretty closely, I understood, you know, like I kind of had a, a learning and compassionate stance, but I did realize like something here wasn't good. Like, and, and I kind of, it kind of clicked like, wait a second. Like I had been taught, you know, on a personal level, I've been taught some of these scriptures meant this and they didn't mean this. And then I was thinking, okay, something here is off. It, and it seems like, you know, these women would point to, well, this leader told me this first means this. And this book says this first means this. And I was kind of like having this awakening to is some, uh, are some of these wife passages, maybe not exactly what we're being told especially mm -hmm. since different leaders had different interpretations of exactly what was expected of a wife. Like whether some books would say only bring up, you know, if he's doing something bad to you only, you know, politely ask for change every so often, every few weeks or months or something. And then another book would kind of say, it's okay. You can speak up for yourself. You can get away. And just, there's so much conflicting information. And I was like, okay, what do these verses actually mean? and um, kind of started doing some digging on that. But I was like, is it possible that, that these verses mean something else? So I forgot to say like, after, <laughs> after like what happened to me in 2017, I started, um, 
I went back to the pastor and like told him my experience, like, okay, like I didn't, you know, I, I knew John 3, 16, I knew God loved me, but I didn't really know what this love was about. And I'm just like, I was, I was viewing these verses through this lens of, um, like I said, kind of God being more punitive, more standoffish and everything. So even though it was saying God loved me, I couldn't quite understand. And so after that, I had just like asked him a ton about a ton of different verses. And then he like got me set up with a workshop with some other people, but like how to study the Bible for myself or for ourselves a little bit better. And so I was just using a Bible study, like how to study and interpret the Bible. Um, I did not have Greek or any of that experience, but I was scouring that book for my for my own like personal verses that were kind of sticky points. Maybe they've been interpreted um, a little bit off and that felt to me like it had a massive impact. But I started using those same um, Bible study guidelines, like the application tips and interpretation tips and that kind of stuff in my, um, in looking at some of the wife verses. And I, I, I know I'm no expert at all, but it seemed like a few of the things that really stuck out that the, the, um, how to study the Bible book was saying, um, made a few things stuck out that like, um, I'll tell you the three, like, don't scream where scripture whispers. I was like, okay, that makes a ton of sense. Context is key. And also meaning it can't mean something now. It didn't mean at the time it was written and like applying the Bible study principles, like that I was learning consistently, like in a nutshell, those are the three things that really stuck out to me. And as I was looking at these passages, I was like, okay, like is are good Bible study methods being used to get to the interpretation that I'm often told these verses mean? And I had to, I have to defer somewhat to other, um, other experts because I'm no expert, but I, I did feel like I had a right and a responsibility to study for myself. And then I started also looking at other experts and realizing, okay, this, this leader who's telling me this has a lot more education than I do. But then there's this leader who's, got 10 more years on them on studying the Greek or studying this. And they're saying something significantly different and they're, they're faithful, they're missionaries, they're Bible translator, there's, they're whatever. And it kind of, it really broadened my horizons to like, I was taught something very confidently, but it was not, um, it was not taking into account that there are actually more perspectives on this. And I started listening to some of so it. I'm wondering if, you know, I, I'm, we could almost put this on the screen is you were talking several minutes ago and I thought, well, there's that verse from Ephesians just popped up. And then well, that verse from first Timothy just popped up, popped in my mind. Whoop, that verse from Genesis three just popped into my mind. So I want to know how are we doing now? And maybe at to ask you that uh, how did you you want to tell us how you found out about true 316 and has that made any difference in your life yeah um so how i'm doing now i guess i'll start i'll just start briefly by saying like i don't experience a minor form of panic or you know faux judgment in my mind anymore when i say hey we should pray or hey girls did you catch this from the sermon or you know when i'm um, I feel like I can confidently share without any fear of like God kind of disapproving, um, any insights mm -hmm. that I have in his word. And, you know, I'm not going to be right a hundred percent about the way I see a Bible verse, but I do know it's a lot easier for me to even be corrected when I have a bad idea, if I'm using my voice to speak up and to say, Hey, I was thinking about this. And I just think it's way more beautiful to be able to share freely. Um, and my husband appreciates like I feel free to directly communicate and guess what like so much easier to relate to other people when you're not kind of hoping they guess what you're thinking but you just start sharing um I do it kindly but anyways um it's very much better I I believe um how I learned about 316 I was listening to a podcast it was um Fair Marriage podcast with Sheila you were on that episode and um, you were talking about Genesis 316. And I thought, bingo, like the Ephesians, um, First Timothy, so many of um, these verses that I've been taught, like set really tight limits on women. 
um, they would go back to the created order. They would go back to Genesis to talk about how it's always been this way, or, you know, this was God's design, at least for after the fall. And um, I thought, okay, this is really interesting. Is somebody who obviously um, takes God's word seriously. I think that's another um, thing I've been kind of conditioned is like, you had to see these verses this way, or, um, you kind of had a low regard for God's word. And so I, I kind of was always worried if somebody was going to, um, deviate from this path I'd been kind of taught was the right path. I was always like relieved if I found out they were like a missionary or Bible translator or like, you know, hadn't fallen away from God. I don't know, but I, I found so many people that did not fall away from God and had a passion <laughs> for, for missions and for, for sharing the gospel. So anyways, it was like beautiful to um, just that that kind of came across my path. And so I ordered your book and I like devoured it in an afternoon. And it was so amazing because um, it cleared up like so many questions that I had about Genesis that I didn't even, I hadn't even put down, but um, I started realizing, okay, like, these people who had taught me Genesis 316 means this. I think they can be well-intentioned. I don't know their motives, but it definitely, definitely helped me see like that interpretation that I had been taught was not like, did not have more substance, um, was not like the right way, was not like the path I had to stay on if I um, had a high regard for scripture and had like wanted to do God's will and God's work and everything. And so that was just very, very freeing. And, um, yeah, yeah. well, that's, that's how, awesome. Like said, I'm probably inter- answering more questions. You, you asked, how did I find out? And now I'm going on and on. Oh, no, I love hearing all of this. It's so fun. And I found myself laughing at the whole, like, I definitely have grown up in that, seeing that in so many of the Christian environments I was in of like, well, if you, if you have this particular view of women, um, you must have thrown out the Bible as an authority, you know, and you're, or you're really loose with your interpretation and you're not yeah. actually about what the text says. And uh, so I, yeah, I, it's so familiar to me. And it's funny to hear you be like, so I was encouraged when they were missionaries or Bible well, translators. Well, it's true. I kind of thought they would just be like, um, you can interpret God, you know, like I, that's the feel that's like the flavor I'd gotten was like, like, this um stance on what these bible passages had to mean was handed to me with like if you don't believe it this way then you don't care about your faith and so i i just like you know autopilot just like always believed it um i well, remember we, yeah. well this you know this when when we you, when you started looking at the book of eden i based that on my wife's research that she's the old testament professor mm-hmm. and a missionary and on this episode, we have proof because, Christy, where were you born? I was born in Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo. <laughs> so here, this the Book of Eden was written by a missionary, mm-hmm. a PhD in Old Testament, you know, who who was straight out of Africa. So you know, I, I'm glad we're checking all the flags for people <laughs> you can trust. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and yeah. and the low regard for scripture, what I started putting together was like, I was, I was probably making a nuisance out of myself asking people like local people who I felt like had more Bible knowledge than me. I was like, okay, help me out, help me out, help me out. And I realized like, I think I'd put people on pedestals. Like if they have a microphone and they speak authoritatively, I was kind of like, okay, they know more than I do. And had kind of disregarded my, I think my responsibility to study it deeper for myself and like be a good Berean, right? Like, yeah, I was just going to say that. I was just going to say like the Bereans were commended for searching the scriptures every day for themselves. And I'm sure they weren't all scholars. So I love that you, I love that you brought that up. Yeah. Right. And so I started realizing too, that like, like you're right. Like Joy had done tremendous, like a tremendous amount of work studying every word in so much more depth than some of the people that I was talking to locally. And so that was also helpful because it's like, it um, dismissed in my mind, any possibility of like, okay, this view was gotten to because of a low regard of scripture. It was like, okay, no, her, her, her pains with the scripture was that a, it was just at a bar, you know, especially with some of these verses, was that a 
a bar higher than these interactions I was having like locally or um, with some of the books I was reading. So that so, was really So really when, helpful. when, when Joy and I went to Africa and, and Joy was very pregnant. And so after a couple of months, Christy came along and uh, then we had to move to another missionary station in, in, in Africa. And uh, we had been there for oh a couple of weeks. And then some people decided that we should be robbed by them. And they broke into our house in the evening. Joy was nursing Christy in the back of the house. I was off to the side. There was one little faucet from the city water that was dripping, literally dripping. And so I had to go out there and, and hold a, a plastic container to catch the water that we were going to use for the next 24 hours. And so while Joy was in the back with Christy and I was off to the side with the water faucet, public water faucet, they came in through the front door. They stole some of Christy's little baby toys. They stole uh, some of the silverware from the kitchen and they stole a metal filing box that they thought was a strong box full of treasure. It had all of my PhD research in it all handwritten. These were in the days before the computers. So they stole all those things and it was gone. Boom. They took it away. And, and I lost all my research. Joy had done her work on Genesis two and three, but I had been researching other things, but as a result of that theft, and it was like a death of the family. I'd lost my dissertation. I, oh, I was encouraged. Oh my yeah. I was encouraged later on. They said, well, isn't there anything else that you've done at this, at this research level? And I said, well, when we were in France, Joy did a work, a, a wonderful workshop one month on Genesis 2, and then the next month she did Genesis 3, and then the next month they said, would you do Ephesians 5? And she said, I'm an Old Testament person. Why don't you ask Bruce? And I, I really wasn't planning on doing that at all. So I ended up doing Ephesians 5, and, and then the next month they said, would you do another one? So my doctorate, doctoral dissertation ended up then being on these passages in the light of, of Eden. So I, I have to say something that came yesterday. We were working on the French translation of, of Joy's material. And it came out that women are more easily deceived and you can't trust them and you can't let them lead because they're more gullible. And that's not the point of what happened at the Garden of Eden. We didn't fall like we were all ready to, ready to fall. And the woman wasn't the temptress. Satan was the tempter, the serpent tempter did the tempting did the attacking talk lied to her and made her think she was doing something good the man he he bought it but he decided to do it on purpose so if she was deceived that means she was a second degree sinner but if he wasn't deceived that means he did it on purpose he was a first degree sinner mm -hmm. first degree murder gets punishment more strict than second degree murder right mm -hmm. so in the new testament passage in first timothy the same thing paul said you know Adam wasn't deceived and Eve was deceived. And people say, well, that's see how women are. Well, no, actually, it's see how Adam was. You know, it, and Paul is saying, I, I want to retrain these women teachers who went astray in, in Ephesus because they weren't big, bad, you know, rebels. They, they got off the track, but they can now be restored to ministry. So the True 316 message allows us to recalibrate misinterpretations of these passages. Is there a passage or a verse that sticks out that's now more helpful to you and less hurtful to you? Oh, well, besides Genesis 3.16, um, Ephesians 5 comes to mind. First Timothy also comes to mind. That's, I think, the, oh, she shall be saved through childbearing. Like, um, that passage, I think, has been interpreted so many different ways, Um and I guess like 12 through 15, probably that whole passage just, um, it seems to change a little depending on who was speaking on it, but like the gist of it was usually like, made me feel like, kind of like I said at the beginning, like just don't trust my discernment. Mm -hmm. um, and but when, so, you, when, when you see so many well, interpretations, that means they're all trying to get it and, and something's wrong. There's a piece that's, that's missing in the puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they just don't get it. And then you realize, well, he's talking about Eve and saying, you know, look, you know, she she did get deceived, but look, she she placed her faith, you know, and God promised her the Messiah. She was saved through Jesus just as as we are, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great thing. And it's it's not a hard passage when you figure that out. Yeah. No, it's it gave so much more clarity. Um my 
Um, like I said, there were some questions that I didn't even know I had that you like helped answer with the, the 316 book. But one thing that I think is kind of funny and I'll just share it. It was like growing up, I used to tell one of my sisters that women were doubly cursed. Like I, I remember being frustrated. Um, I think I kind of had this, the understanding that if I expressed too much frustration with God, then he would be even more reluctant to like be, but you know, be friendly towards me or whatever. So mm. I, I had been like kind of keeping lots of my frustrations to myself, but I remember telling her like, okay, so, so my understanding was sort of women's curse was reproductive pain and you know what that might look like, but reproductive pain and problems was kind of women's curse. Men's curse was work. And that's probably like a simplified way of looking at it, but that was kind of my understanding growing up. Yeah. And so I remember telling my sister, like women are doubly cursed because I would look around me and I would see my dad was going to work. Yes. And yet also my mom was working all day and you know, the mothers of everyone I knew was working all day. And it didn't seem like that was really a split thing where women had only these like reproductive, um, cares and work and problems. But, um, it seemed like women also had the man's curse, which I thought was the working part. So anyways, that was one thing I like. Wow. Afterwards, I was like, remember how you used to always say that, you know, this is kind of the way the, passage actually um the way the passage the way you talk about the passage where the word for toil is in both made so much more sense I was like okay God is being honest because women women work women are hard workers so anyway I thought that was funny when when I was when I was interviewed by Sheila the first time uh that came up she used the phrase I had never heard before and I'm ignorant sorry but she talked about Eve's curse Mm. like everybody knew what Eve's curse was and I and of course then Joy says God didn't curse Adam and God didn't curse Eve Mm -hmm. and God didn't curse. It didn't limit woman in any way. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a thought about Eve's curse, now, when we were missionaries, we came across people who said, well, pain in childbirth. And Joy said, that's not what the Hebrew says, you know, Mm -hmm. and they said, and they said, well, that's what it is in our translation. Yeah. Then see, there's the problem. We got to get to the translators and clear, clean that up. Mm -hmm. But they said, see, if, if she was zapped with pain in childbirth, then she must have deserved it. And she must, you know, then God had to put the hammer down. And then we have to put the hammer down on, on all her daughters as well and restrict them in church and restrict mm-hmm. them in the home and restrict them in society. What a mess, you know, what mm-hmm. a mess if you get that wrong. Yeah, I know there's like, there's a lot of implications for it if you're um, viewing it from that lens for sure. And like, and so, you know, yeah, even inside of me, I was like, okay, well, I feel like this is good that I'm, that I'm praying with my family, but also, Maybe I shouldn't be because I'm a woman. I mean, that's so silly now, but that was definitely something that impacted me. Very sad. Um, I love that part where um, you touched on how, okay, if women, you know, if if Eve sinned, it was unintentionally and Adam must have done it intentionally. And I had been, I had been like, so I thought I was so well versed in like these teachings, these, um, the, in the word of God, because I had received a lot, a lot of religious instruction, but it was that, that pastor that I mentioned, and he's passed away now, and I'm so, still so sad, but his name was Brad Johnson, and he really, um, really fanned the flame of, like, um, studying God's word in me, and I remember he pointed that out, I was asking him questions about that, um, first Timothy passage, I think, where, um, it goes back to, like, created order and stuff, anyways, he pointed out, he's like, um, well, if she sinned unintentionally, like, is it better to trust the man who sinned on purpose, like knowing what he was doing? And then when that was um, restated in your book, I was like, okay, this, there's just, coming from what I come from, there was so much freedom in that, that like, God wasn't trying to make me question my, my brain. Like my brain was not like, worse at figuring stuff out and also like i am filled with the holy spirit why would um the holy spirit decide to indwell females if we can't be trusted like what's the point um if the point what's the point of the holy spirit coming on to me if i still can't be trusted because of eve's unintentional sin and so um just a lot of clarity and a lot of freedom there for Mm -hmm. sure Hmm. That's so what, what we're doing is we're kind of experiencing what what we do in our in the uh, our true school. We have the workshops on Genesis two and three. That's called we call that the Eden workshop. And did you do one of those, Bethany? Yeah, I did. Yep. Yeah, yeah. and then we have the then 
for super achievers, they go on to the, the Beyond Eden workshop on Ephesians 5 and 6, and then the Back to Eden on 1 Timothy 2 and 3, and then the Because of Eden on, on 1 Corinthians and 1 Peter. And so we've, we've now had a number of people go through those workshops with us. And part of the fun of it is that we get to do Zoom conversations. So not only do we study the passages, but we get to talk out things like we're just talking out here, you know, mm-hmm. Bethany, that you were able to get that out of, mm-hmm. <laughs> worked out and and uh, and straightened up. It's, it's very, very encouraging. Well, we're going to have to come back to you another time because we're out, we're out of time for this episode. But uh, Christy, thank you. My Dr. pleasure. Yeah. And, Loved uh, it. Bethany, thank you for taking us, bringing us into your life and, and showing us what's going on there. Yeah, Absolutely. Thank you. And we, it's an we'll, honor to talk to you both. Thank you so much. And we'll keep track of you and the four kids and and uh, what you call him, your dude. Yeah. So. And those and those goats. Oh, yeah. Gotta yes. bring it back full and circle. All right. All right. <laughs> Take All right. care. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. True 316 Foundation is the home of the Eden Podcast. Join us for $3.16 a month or more. Let's true the verses on the key passages on women and men. Go to true316.com slash partner. True 316 is strengthening and encouraging many, and we're getting stories every day of lives changed through our ministry. We're the home of the Eden Podcast, and we're getting the word out that God didn't curse Eve or Adam, or limit woman in any way. Our volunteer help is wonderful, and we grow stronger with each new true partner who gives to the True 316 Foundation so that we can cover the costs to do the technical work of the Eden Podcast, to coordinate our true school workshops like the two-week Eden Workshop on Genesis 2 and 3, and to make the True 316 Foundation function in its outreach to scholars and students around the world. You can give now with a one-time gift, And better still, you can join now and become a monthly donor. We call our monthly donors our true partners. Please join now by going to true316.com slash partner.